first of all, thank you very much for that introduction. I want to uh, tell you, first of all, I'm not a minister. I'm not ordained in any form of Buddhism. I don't represent anybody. So <laughs> for that reason, you can hurl slings and arrows at me. But I should also tell you that um, I've been interested in Pure Land Buddhism since I was a, a, a master's student uh, at UCLA, in which my teacher was Ashikaga Ensho, who was a Higashi minister from Sakai, south of Osaka, and uh, who was interested in Tantric Buddhism. And I thought, well, that's very cool. So, um, and as a result, I became interested in Buddhism and went to Japan at the age of 19 and um, things kind of went downhill from there, but uh, I just never was satisfied with anything. So I learned Japanese to the point that I could begin to read modern Japanese scholarship, and then I realized that they're all using Chinese, the scriptures. And so then I learned to study Chinese, and the Kyoko Shinjo is in Chinese, and then Shinran's always quoting the Nirvana Sutra, so then I studied the Nirvana Sutra in Chinese, and then I studied Sanskrit because all these, you know, it goes on and on. Anyway, so it took me a long time to get here, but. Um, also, you know, my perspective, even though I've, I'm only really studied Shinshu at, in the, on the Higashi side, at Otani Daigaku. And it's, and, uh, but I also very interested in Honen, and I've uh, been translating Honen's writings for the Jodo Shu for the past eight years, particularly his Japanese language writings, which are much more personal, much more direct in a way. And that's a fascinating project. And so I'm very also close to the Jodo Shu, so you're getting a kind of another insinuous other perspective. That's not Honganji. Uh, but I very much believe that Shinran's relationship to Honen should not be forgotten. It's extremely important. And Shinran repeatedly, you know, like uh, in the Tani show where he says, you know, Shaki couldn't be wrong, then Amida couldn't be wrong, and then, then he goes to Zendo, to, to Dao, uh, Shandao, and then to Honen, and then to himself. So, you know, this is very much, in some sense, what the Shoshinge is all about, and very much anyone who's in the Shinshu tradition, that's where you stand, is within that line. Um, and so we have to, as much as possible, keep these things in mind. But it's hard to study this stuff, um, because a lot of these materials are not available in English translation. And even if you can read uh, Buddhist classical Chinese, these texts are hard to read. Or Kamakura period Ch Japanese is also hard to read. It takes time. So in some sense, I feel like I've got this far, I sort of have an obligation. So the Nirvana Sutra project is my life insurance policy, but um, <laughs> that happens, right? So anyway. Um, also, you know, I brought this book to show you, uh, it's, f f thank God it's out in paperback. I don't get any royalties from it, so, um, but they didn't make me pay a subsidy, thank God. Get it published. But this Seishin Shugi reader, that's the idea, uh, came from this. And it came from a project that I was doing with Jan van Brad, who was a Catholic priest uh, from Belgium, who, with me, we found out we were both in love with Soga Ryoji. Uh, and Soga is this brilliant, phenomenal, incomprehensible Shinshu philosopher on the Otani side, the Higashi side. And um, as a Catholic priest, he was interested in him. And I myself, just as a student of Buddhism, was fascinated by Soga. And then we found a study group based in Shiga Prefecture that had Nishi people in it and Higashi people in it. We're all reading Soga together and trying to figure it out. And we decided, well, there's no translations. Let's try to do some translations and put something out. Um, and so after many years, unfortunately, Jan died, uh, but we got the book out. So this is a. Um, I have an introduction in the beginning, which is sort of puts this into historical context. That is essentially Shinshu in the Meiji period. So a lot of stuff I'm going to talk about today comes from that. Uh, but um, you have representative essays of all the four major people in this tradition, um, which are Kiyozawa, Soga, Kanako, and Yasuda. And um, it's worth looking at when you have Okay. So Bakumatsu, that term refers to the end of the Edo period. Um, as Reverend Matsumoto pointed out, when the two, when Honganji was split into two, and as a uh, footnote here, remember the Honganji does not equal Jodo Shinshu. There are seven or eight branches, I can't remember, um, of Shinshu. The other ones are still going strong, okay. 
and they think they are the legitimate tradition of Shinran. So we have to keep them in mind as well. Um, they are smaller, and they don't have a presence, I guess, outside Japan. Uh, but they've been very influential. And in fact, a lot of the, um, the Takaraha in particular, which is based in Mie Prefecture, has a number of Shinran's handwritten writings, okay, which are very useful for those of us who are studying, trying to get back to the original, uh, trying to reconstruct who Shinran was. Anyways, the Tokugawa, this is about sort of what happens as the Tokugawa starts to break down. Because I think the story of the Tokugawa is really, in terms of thought, and action and how they understand Buddhism really begins here. We don't really know much about how Shinshu was taught in the Edo period. It's a big kind of research question. Reconstructing the curriculum of the seminaries, for example. Uh, the Jodo Shu people now are working on this quite hard, and I think we'll probably see similar good work on the Shinshu side, but it's just beginning. But we do know that there were some conflicts that occurred, okay? And I also look at publications, because you can go through lists of catalogs, okay, uh, of what's extant today in libraries to see what kind of books were written by whom on what, okay? So part of my talk is gonna be about that. Anyway, uh, the Tokugawa government issues newly strengthened laws in 1825 requiring a warlike response to any foreign ships entering Japanese waters, okay? So, you know, Japan is supposedly sealed off from about 1830, I mean 1630, sorry, but this is a very porous kind of um, isolation policy. Trade with Korea, trade with China still going on. It's basically they don't want Europeans coming in. Um, and so to the degree that people can make money from trade, that's allowed to happen, okay? Uh, when the Ming Dynasty falls around 1650, there's a huge influx of refugees that come from China. That Ming Dynasty collapsed, what took about 10, 15 years to complete, complete's a funny word anyway, to, to finally get finished. And so a lot of people were suffering greatly. So great civil war in China. A lot of people came to Osaka, Sakai area, uh, and this had a big impact on Edo period culture. One way it had a big impact was we have a new school of Buddhism, the Haku school, for example, which is a Nembutsu and Zen combination. We have a whole new th uh, theories about how Confucianism was studied, because in China there's a whole new way of looking at Confucianism uh, at that time that comes into Japan in a big way. Uh, and then we have, for the first time, Japanese scholars who are interested in how to study Chinese text how to pronounce them properly, living among Chinese refugees so they can learn to speak Chinese. So until this time, we have a lot of Japanese writing in Chinese who can't speak Chinese. So it's kind of an odd thing, and they're writing in Chinese even though people are gonna be reading what they're writing in Japanese. Uh, so it's kind of a funny, uh, funny language. But in the Edo period, Japanese who wanna read and write in Chinese for the first time can actually learn to speak Chinese. And that changes things quite a bit as well. Um, Anyway, but this paranoia from, on the part of the government just seems to get stronger and stronger. And the degree of paranoia toward the foreigners seems to echo the weakness of the government. That is, as the government gets weaker, their paranoia gets greater, okay? You probably could apply that to various political situations. We don't have to go into that, but anyway. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the really striking things that happens is something called the Morrison Incident in 1837 in which um, Japanese sailors were shipwrecked off Macau uh, and were picked up uh, by this American merchant ship who was just trading in the area. And um, the captain said, well, I can bring you back to Japan. Maybe we can do a little business. And so they came carrying these seven Japanese sailors and they came to Kagoshima hoping to, to you know, return them to Japan uh, and instead they were fired upon by cannon. So, um, and the Japanese were not able to get off the ship. They had no choice but to go back to Macau, back to Hong Kong and somehow survive there. And that was the end of their life, you know. So, it was, so this incident was criticized very heavily by a lot of people saying the government is going too far. Um, but then the Japanese, the Bakufu, the government's response to the people who criticized them was to arrest them and put them in jail, okay. So again, we're seeing this kind of knee-jerk reactionary response to the fact that the outside world is all around us and getting closer, you know. Um, and it's not a smooth transition. 
1840, okay, we have the Opium Wars in China. This, most people don't relate this to Japanese history, but actually it's very important because the Opium Wars are a kind of peasant revolt, revolt right? A peasant rebellion against the authorities in China and the British you know, rule over China, the parts of China or through the Chinese king, the Chinese emperor. And what happens, of course? The British defeat, the British are successful in the Opium Wars. What does that signal to the Japanese? The Japanese, of course, learn about this immediately. That, in fact, these foreigners are really dangerous, okay? If Britain can be successful in China, right, so far away from Britain, imagine what they could do here. So the government becomes more paranoia, more paranoid, okay? And then, of course, you have Commodore Perry sailing into Tokyo Bay. Um, and before this time, we know there are French ships and Dutch ships also sailing into Tokyo Bay uh, and trying to trade and being told to leave. So there is constant contact of foreigners trying to figure out how to deal with Japan. And of course, another big part of this is whaling. The whaling industry is a very big industry. The whole first half of the 19th century, you took at the American Revolution, a big source of income was whaling. Where are the whales? They're in the Pacific Ocean. So, of course, boats need to stop and p get food and repair their boats, you know, because of damage from storms and things. And the Japanese, obviously, are not able to accommodate this. Anyway, um, we have earthquakes and tsunami in Japan, 1854 and 1855, signaling something is happening. Okay. Uh, so, so, by the um, we, the Japanese government grudging, begrudgingly allows some foreigners to therefore stay in Japan uh, and they sign these kind of trade treaties, limited treaties, okay, uh, because they realize that with Commodore Perry's ship with the big guns they really can't compete with it. So what happens if one of the first things that happens at this time is the gold, Japanese gold disappears. Japanese gold disappears because the exchange rate in Japan between gold and silver is completely different than what it is in the West. And if all the foreigners realize, oh my God, I can buy gold for half the price it costs, take it home and sell it at home and make a killing. And everybody does this. And of course, it's just a public market. So suddenly there's no more gold in Japan. So this, again, this shows the, the ineptitude of the Japanese government because they don't have contact with the rest of the world. And this is another sign that they really have to give up on this. Um, so the 18th, this, the, 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 the whole economy gets turned upside down in this time as a result of things like this. We have, you know, famines, uh, peasant uprisings are happening, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, you know, in 1866, the Bakufu government, uh, we have open civil war to, to them. Um, and as you know, by 1868, finally, uh, the Bakfu was thrown out. We have the Meiji government. Okay. Now, something that a lot of people don't know is, in fact, during this civil war, in the last two years of the Edo period, the two Honganji took opposite sides. And I think this had a big impact on how it developed in the Meiji period. This is a blum theory, okay? <laughs> so, uh, the transition a rough process that took years to complete. The Honganji Ha aligned itself with the anti Bakfu uh, early in the conflict and remained supporters of that movement. Okay, the rebels, right? The old Tani Ha remained loyal to the Tokugawa government. When the Tokugawa government was overthrown, the new Meiji government didn't like the Higashi people because they had supported their enemies. So this led to a completely different attitude in the Meiji government toward the two Honganjis. That is, the Higashi was kind of pushed out, alienated, ostracized, uh, and regarded with greater suspicion by the Meiji government than the Nishi side. Now this has, all, um, has consequences. So um, the Nishi side, because they're closer to the new government, and particularly in the early Meiji period, we have this Haibutsu Kishaku thing that we'll talk about in a minute that Reverend Masamoto mentioned, uh, this kind of suppression of Buddhism. And this really comes out of, um, anyway, uh, that in a time when the government is explicitly anti-Buddhist, the Nishi side is a little bit more protected because of their political alliance from before the Meiji Restoration. Uh, and, the Higashi, and therefore, they tend to develop more conservative policies. Now, one of the things that happens in the Meiji period uh, is that the government, what makes, one of the things that makes Japan kind of unique among all Buddhist countries is they develop a ministry of education quite early. 
uh, in the Meiji period, and they develop a notion of a national language quite early. No one else is doing this until the 20th century. But in Japan, you have this happening in the 1880s and the 1890s. So you have a ministry of education, you have a national curriculum, and a national public school system, you have a national language that the central government is deciding what that should be. Um, and of course this certainly helps in terms of getting everybody working together and better communication, et cetera, et cetera, and kind of creating a unified culture. You can take advantage of this, and everybody eventually does this. It doesn't happen in China, for example, until after the war, but <clears throat> after World War II. But what but um, in this, in this system, one of the things that the government is pushing in its educational policy is what's called dotoku, which is not up on here, but dotoku means morality or ethics. But dotoku, the way the government puts it in the, in the textbooks, is loyalty to the emperor, right? And not complaining, right? And joining and supporting nationalism and militarization, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, what happens? This creates a lot of difficulty for all Buddhists. Well, the whole tradition of Buddhism is that the Buddhist Sangha um, in India exists politically outside the government forces. It has extraterritoriality, you know, in some sense. Uh, now, in China, that's eventually eroded, and in Japan, it never really existed. But Shinran is very explicit about the fact that the government really doesn't have anything to say about how we want our religion. Uh, Nichiren is the same way. So. The kind of new movements of Buddhism in the Kamakura period in the 13th century that become the dominant forms of Japanese Buddhism as we know it today are all in some sense fighting against that presumption that the government should control, for example, who gets ordained, as uh, what the teaching should be of a particular school. In the Edo period, for example, you're not allowed to build a new temple until you got permission from the government. So that sense of control, if anything, in the Edo period is stronger than earlier because of this new Confucianism coming in, what we call Neo-Confucianism from the Ming refugees, which asserts the government should take total control, right? And should dictate what morality is. And so that becomes the basis of the Edo period rule, but the Meiji period sort of follows the same presumption, but says, well, it's a whole new game now because we're involved in the international community. And what's happening in 1860s and 1870s internationally is imperialism. We all know this. So um, all the powerful European countries felt justified in taking colonies. So Japan obviously has to defend itself. Under that system, um, the Nishi is trying to figure out a way to accommodate itself, and it goes quite far. And it goes so far as to say that the two truths of Buddhism, which, uh, which used to be, <laughs> in the traditional scheme, the idea that Buddhism has two truths is very old, it goes back to India, that uh, the, tr the worst truth is the sort of worldly truth that we can know by study, by measuring, things like that. And that includes the study of Buddhism, because it's limited because our understanding is limited. And then the higher truth, the ultimate truth, is the truth that Buddhas know. If the nirvanic truth, you might call it. So when Buddhas talk to each other, they don't talk in the way that we talk. Okay, So that's what we're trying to attain. And uh, Shonyo, I think, who is the Nishi Monshu at the time of the Meiji Restoration, sends out a, a letter right before he dies to so all the ministers saying the two truths should be defined as the worldly truth is the truth of the government and you should follow the government. Okay? And the ultimate truth is the Buddhist truth, and that's an interior dialogue. You can just keep that to yourself. Okay? <laughs> so this is obviously a very strong form of accommodation, right? Okay. Um, so all revolutions justify violence against the state by a sense of moral outrage and express need to establish a new social order. That's the sort of universal uh, the ideology of the Meiji government was based on three principles we call nativist. Nativism means kind of strong nationalism. Only the emperor can be a legitimate ruler of Japan. This justifies overthrowing the shogun because the shogun is not from the imperial family, right? Society needs to be restored to an ancient original ideology defined as being a fusion of national. So national learning is something that took place in the um, Edo period, and it's based on sort of rediscovering the Japanese way of thinking from ancient texts like the Manyoshu and the Kojiki, you know, way back before the Nara period, but they first appear in the Nara. Ancient poetic traditions, that is Japanese culture before Chinese influence. That's what they're trying to reconstruct. Now today, when we look at that kind of scholarship, we find it really creative and really inventive, but they had no idea what they're doing. 
I mean, nobody knows what the Japanese culture was like before Chinese influence because they didn't have a writing system. Nonetheless, that's, that's the kind of uh, ideology you can see that can lend itself to a very kind of strong nationalist feeling, right? That we know what the Japanese, original Japanese way of thinking was, and that's pure, right? And we should hold on to that. It's a kind of a fundamentalism. Um, and you don't, nobody can say they're wrong because they don't know what it is anyway. Uh, and therefore, the only proper religion for the Japanese people is Shinto, right? Buddhism is foreign, right? Just like Chinese Confucianism is foreign. So this is how the Meiji government also kind of justifies its own position in power. After all, the people didn't vote for the Meiji government. It's a civil war. They overthrew the old government by force. So it's sort of like the Communist Party in China. All right. OK, so the new order. So we try to create a notion of Japanese identity based around the Shinto. And they established what called Koka Shinto, uh, which actually ends up being very controversial. And people like Shimaji Mokurai on the Nishi side are very interesting because he wants to establish this national Shinto, but he says, that's not religion. That's politics, OK? And many of the Shinto shrines follow suit. They say, yeah, that's not us. That's not Shinto. That's politics. So the government's having a very hard time pushing this agenda. So Reverend Masamoto mentioned the Daikyoin, which is a fascinating experiment, where the government decided <laughs> that they were going to set up these schools around the country and have all the religious leaders go to these schools and get re-educated. Sounds like China. Get re-educated. And in the national religion, okay, the new religion, which is supposed to be a fusion of Buddhism and Shin. Right? In Tokyo. Zojoji. Why is Zojoji the biggest temple in Tokyo? Zojoji is a Jodoshu temple because Tokugawa family was Jodoshu, okay? So the government's sort of by eminent domain, so it doesn't take the temple, but just tells the temple, you're going to hold Daikyo in there. And after a few months of this, all the people, all the Buddhists say, this is, sorry, BS. <laughs> just remember that I'm being filmed, right, recorded. So, <laughs> and the Shinshu people are, are noteworthy for walking out on it, okay? And at that point, because Shinshu is by far the largest religion in Japan, uh, it falls apart, okay? But the government keeps trying one way or another. Anyway, um, so I think a very important Part of this story is that prior to the Meiji period, Buddhism and Shinto and Confucianism belonged just fine together. They were not at odds with each other. They were not in conflicts. They're not in conflict is because they had different roles to play. So we have Buddhist priests living in Shinto temples. We have Confucianism taught in schools by Buddhist temples. Some of the oldest Buddhist manuscript canons we have are from Shinto shrines in the Kyoto area. Okay, so there was no conflict here. The ethics, law, and education is a domain of Confucianism, apotropaic, that is kind of magical things of warding off evil, uh, exorcism, you know, prayer for safe childbirth, all sorts of things where you need some immediate help. That's where Shinto comes in. The Shinto. And appeal to the Shinto Kami for this. There are different roles, and there really doesn't seem to be much conflict at all. You don't hear about this at all until quite late. It's also the background. Now, what happens, therefore? What are the social obligations of the Buddhist temples in this new in this new world, where the government is saying, "No, no, we got to separate these things." Uh, and so, what is the what are the Buddhists supposed to do? So there's a various structural reforms that I mentioned. And the bottom line was from the educational curriculum. And if you don't have any experience living in Japan, you may appreciate this. But in Japan, even today, all schools use a uh, can happen throughout the whole nation at the same time. Okay, So uh, there is some variation of which textbooks to choose. but at Elementary school level, a lot of these books are the same. We don't have anything like that in the United States. Even in California, you're not going to get that kind of uniformity. When the government, though, the Ministry of Education in, in the United States barely exists. The Republicans are always trying to get rid of it because why should Washington be involved in what they teach in Culver City, right? But 
in Japan, the Ministry of Education is powerful, very powerful. And who gets named as the minister is big news. So, um, it, you know, you can't imagine the Ministry of Education running for president, for example. But in Japan, that's the step up to prime minister is Ministry of Education. So it's a, it's a very important role. In any case, the Buddhists have to justify themselves in a way they never had to do before. Buddhism was just taken for granted. Uh, Buddhism. Why are you there? What's your contribution? Okay. So some and articulate what is their contribution to society why does what justifies this you know this is a little bit akin to what happened when Buddhism first came to China and the um, one of the hallmarks of the Buddhist movement in India was that Buddhist monks are not allowed to hold money and they're not allowed to store food and they're not allowed to cook so if you're a Buddhist monk or you're a Buddhist nun how do you eat every day you go out and beg Right? It's set up that way intentionally. And if people make donations of food to the temple in excess of what the monks can eat on that day, or they make donations of money, then there has to be a lay person working in the temple office to take care of these things. Buddhist priests are not allowed to have any contact with that kind of thing. And Buddhism moves to China, and the, the Buddhist monks start begging, and the Chinese say, what are you doing? <laughs> Beggars are messed up people who are poor and don't have jobs, you know. You're supposed to be some kind of high religion with all these scriptures and learning and all this stuff. So guess what happened? Begging disappeared, okay? So the Chinese figured out a way to redefine the monastic system as a social institution. It's just what I'm saying. This is a political problem, not a philosophical problem. And so this is the same kind of thing that happens in Japan. Justify your position in society. Justify what your contribution is. Justify people making donations of the temple. Pass in a way very uh, strongly from the government, right? In a way that before. the Japanese government had never suppressed Buddhism before this time. It always had been supportive. You know, the typical thing is Buddhism and the government are like two wings of a bird. You need both wings to fly, right? Two wheels of a cart. You can't move unless. So, um, where am I? Okay, so although the intensity of this hostility waxed and waned, the mood, the kind of anti Buddhist mood of the, of the ruling culture, essentially continued from, starts at, in around the 1840s in a major way. It was way back in the early Edo period in some places in Japan. Um, but nationally, it really picks up in the 1840s. Uh, you can see essays published on this. And then it really goes up to World War, in the World War II. It's essentially 100 years of this, OK? Um, and this produced a variety of reaction from pro-government nationalism to fatalism. Well, what the heck, you know? To apathy. Nothing we can do about it. Let's just ignore stuff and uh, go have a beer. No, let's go, <laughs> go read the Tanisha. I don't know. Anyway. And, and another reaction was a radical turn inward. This is what we see on the Higashi side, OK? Uh, away from an impossible to change social situation toward an inward life, an inward field of activity where change is entirely possible. So one of the things I teach my students all the time is that what makes Buddhism different in India was the Buddha said, you can change who you are. And until that, that was a pretty radical okay. So Nishi Hongaji goes through a series of conflicts over Shinshu doctrine in the Edo to explain why I think the two Honganjis went in different You have this very famous thing called the Sango Wakuran. Any student of Japanese Shinshu history will come across this. But actually, this is a, one of three major conflicts that happen internally within on the Nishi side. And by conflicts, I'm talking about, well, it's a, it's a conflict over power. Who has the right to speak for the temple? What if I come from the provinces and I come to Kyoto to study and I have a different interpretation and people are not allowed to listen to me or I'm not allowed to, be, to teach or something like that. I can't publish. Uh, but it also, of course, deals with you know, what the proper orthodox understanding of Shinran and Pure Land Buddhism is. Um, but the Sango Wakudan is the third and last one because this heated up so badly 
that people got into physical fights, punched each other out, okay, burned some buildings down, and it got so bad that the Bakvu, the government, had to step in and move it into a, a trial with a judge. And they actually had Jinrei, one of the Higashi scholars, be on the jury, or sort of an advisor to the, the magistrate, to help them sort out what was going on. In other words, the Honganji could not sort it out by itself. That's how bad it got. Okay. Now, the result of this, when this fine, when the dust finally settled on the Sango Wakurdan, um, I think the result was that the Nishi sort of intellectual culture said, okay, let's take it easy for a while. <laughs> you know? And it became conservative after that. So it's sort of, people didn't want to ruffle feathers, I think. Um, that's my guess. And um, in 1876, for example, so this is right after the Meiji Restoration, four of the branches of Shinshu put out this joint set of regulations, this Shuki Koyo, uh, which gave enormous power to the leader of each sect, okay, in determining what the orthodox teaching should be, even what the definition of Shinjin was, uh, Shugi, uh, Anjin, no, Shohi, okay. Now, now we're up to High Butsukishaku. Um, so, eliminate Buddhism, destroy Shakyamuni. Now, that's sort of a name given to this um, most extreme form of persecution of Buddhism in the very early Meiji period. Um, but in fact, as I said before, this had been going on in individual um, domains much earlier, um, where we have a, a daimyo, for example, a daimyo, uh, you know, a local lord, deciding that there should be one temple per town, for example. Why do we need all these different Buddhist temples, all these different sects? We just have one. You know, in other words, minimizing the impact of Buddhism uh, on society as a whole, and they would enforce this uh, by force. So, um, but the High Buddha Gishaku uh, event is really a kind of symptom of the separate, forced separation of Buddhism and Shinto results in estimates of up to 60% of all the Buddhist temples in Japan being damaged. Uh, some burnt, some eliminated, okay. Uh, Buddhist statues melted down t and used the metal in them used to make guns and bullets. It was kind of a really depressing time. So, um, and a lot of this art left the country, by the way. One of the reasons we have great collections in the West is because of this, you know. Okay. Now, what about Western ideas in the Meiji period? So after this period, the high Busuki shock only lasts a couple years, and then the government realized they've gone too far. Um, and again, my understanding is for the, nearly all Japanese, um, Buddhism and Shinto fit fine together. There's no reason that they have to be separated. And there's no reason why one has to be bigger or smaller than the other, because you participated in both, right? Again, because they have different functions. Um, Christian missionaries now, through, of course, pressure from the West, from 1875, are allowed back in the country. Right? Uh, however, that's not the beginning of the Japanese involvement in Western thought. We know as early as 1862, that's before the Meiji Restoration, Nishia Mari and Tsuda Mamichi actually got on a Dutch trading vessel, went all the way to the Netherlands to study Western philosophy. Okay. Notice they don't go to study Christianity, they go to study philosophy. Okay. So, uh, so that means the interest in thinking is already happening in Japan before Japan opens up, right? But of course, not only are the foreigners not allowed in Japan, Japanese are not allowed to leave, right? If they leave, they can't come back. So, but another very important thing and people don't know about is this social Darwinism. So social Darwinism is a real kind of blight uh, on, you might say, world culture. This is my opinion. I apologize for this. But. So we know about Darwinism, right? Evolution, right? Survival of the fittest, right? So we all study this. We all study this as animals evolve. They get stronger. The, the genetic changes happen, right? And the weaker ones, you know, disappear. But social Darwinism uh, by people like Herbert Spencer uh, applies this to society and says, well, some people are stronger than others. And the weak ones should, like snakes or you know, ants, should disappear, right? And the society would just get stronger if the weak people just die. After all, that's what happens with animals. Why shouldn't humans, OK? So this is a very, um, shall we say, unsympathetic view of <laughs> human society. 
And what it says to religions, because religions, after all, are concerned with the weakest, not the strongest. Strong people can take care of themselves. It's the weak people that need help, right? This says to religion, well, we don't need religion because we're scientific, right? And the scientific modern perspective is that weak things die off. And as they die off, all of us get stronger. So this is a real pernicious uh, way of thinking. But of course, nobody knew. This is a new idea. When Darwin's theory of evolution became accepted, that was uh, such a radical idea. Before that time, everyone thought there never been any change. Maybe this did apply to human society as well. Um, Kato Hiroyuki, who is Gakcho, he's a president of Tokyo Daigaku, okay? Tokyo Imperial University. Yeah. <laughs> the candle's unhappy, you think that's what's going on? Should we put it out? Is it too strong? My hair's on. to the main event or back to the sideshow, I don't know. Uh, so one of the things that happens is as social Darwinism comes in and Christianity comes in and Western philosophy comes in, um, of course, have a lot to deal with in time. It's a fertile time, very creative time. And some of the responses to modernity are obviously not very appealing like social Darwinism, and some of them are quite interesting. And most interesting to me is um, the Japanese Buddhist response to Christianity. Okay. So, of course you have missionaries standing on the corner telling people they have to convert or they're going to go to hell, but you also have a lot of interesting books, right, being translated into Japanese. And the people are reading these books and, you know, even though, as I said earlier, there's a lot more interest in Western philosophy than there is in Western religion among intellectuals, the major thinkers in Western philosophy are all Christians, right? So they all have a very uh, biblical perspective. When it comes to ultimate questions, they're seeing a lot of references to you know, notions of God. So, um, and a big part of all this is Fenelosa coming from Boston, Museum of Fine Arts, a teacher at the University of Tokyo in the philosophy department in the 1880s. And, um, so people are learning this stuff. In any case, we see three, there seem to be three, you know, this is what Japanese scholars are saying, there seem to be three levels or three periods in which Buddhism responds to Christianity in the major period. First is antagonism, whereas the Buddhists and the Christians, first third of the major period, publish books attacking each other. That religion is false. Those people are all going to suffer if they follow it. Okay. The second period is they're kind of studying each other a little more, learning more about it. Okay. And they're realizing that neither of them is going to go away. Right. Uh, the third period is one where we begin to see actual kind of mutual respect happening. And we begin to see Buddhist writers using Christian ideas okay, that help explain their perspective. And we see Christians taking a much more serious interest in Buddhism. Now, that's a whole other story. We're not going to go into it. All right, yeah. Um, so this is the two truths before. Skip this. Yeah. Um, but here's a list of what I think the major Talk about that.
as a belief in the value of rational thought and logical thought grows. So you the inside, okay? coming up into the air, and then they open the door, and there's two Buddhas in there, you know. Nobody says, that could never happen, okay? Nobody worried about that. That's because people could think to their thinking in a normal, materialistic way for their everyday lives, right? Two Buddhas in the stupa. Why is the stupa up, stupa up in the air? Okay. Another story about it was science. Uh, so one of the interesting things about major government policy is very strong. Uh, Because for a lot of people who and I'm not happy, you know. <laughs> I got all this money, I got a great car, a big house, I got three wives, no, no, I got one wife, <laughs> many kids, and I don't, and I don't feel any better than I did before. My problems are not solved. So that is very disconcerting if you believed in that, that myth, because that's what it is, it's another myth. Um, and that leads to nihilism. That's a very deep problem. And nobody can, it seems that nobody can help you in that situation because you have, a, your whole life has been constructed on a value system that doesn't work. So um, that's another organization, okay. Um, and then other things, specific to, which is what is, writing about this before. How do you keep me? Thought about, wrote about this, but it's theory that people can really talk. All nations, something like Jodo, okay, about the place. You know what I'm saying? In my head, is it a myth? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. It's of emphasis in modern Hegel. So, kills out my Masamoto showed a picture of and who is one of my heroes, uh, starts something called Seishin Shugi. Shugi just means ism. There are a lot of things, if you read Meiji period Buddhist writing, or a lot of things are called Shugi. I don't know why. So, like, Kyosan Shugi is communism, you know? Shihon Shugi is capitalism. Seishin Shugi, what the heck is that? Spiritism. It doesn't make much sense as English, but that term, adding the Shugi, to a lot of kind of abstract or big words was very popular in the major period. This leads to a lot of difficult to translate terms. Anyway, you know what they're talking about, which is the seishin is the mind, right? And seishin is not just kokoro, but seishin implies the kind of spirit, spiritual side of the mind, right? The kind of intellectually discerning part of the mind that assigns value to things, that is the source of your identity, things like that. When we call that shugi, then you're saying, well, there's a whole kind of cultural apparatus that goes along with this. What should that be? So that's what Seishin Shugi is about. That's what Kilzao was trying to do, was to get people to talk about this more explicitly, right? uh, and to bring these ideas to the fore and create a kind of discussion. So uh, this is really like 
Points of emphasis. So I'm going to read this real quickly. Religious experience is highly valued. This is, this is the, the things that, uh, the points of concern that are prominent in this tradition in the Eastern Home Guns. Okay. Religious experience is highly valued. Sin gene is awakening, not a presence of a set of beliefs. People understand what Shin Jin God, that person has Shin Jin. People on the Higashi side say that, which implies that most people don't have Shin Jin, you know? Uh, so, people talk about Shin Jin on the, in, in the Higashi tradition, particularly this Kyozao tradition, as being a kind of insight, an awakening. You can't just get it by some intellectual argument. You have to feel it, okay? It has to come from inside you and it's therefore inherently irrational. Got it? So your rationality leads to an irrational awakening, something like that. Uh, questioning authority and questioning tradition is essential. Tradition of inquiry that leads to Shinjin, which is liberation. Therefore, Shinjin seems to be Satori in the Higashi rhetoric. The Tani Show, number three, is central way of seeing Shinran. Problems with the provenance of the text, that is, we don't really know how it came into existence. And it's pretty clear that Shinran didn't write it, certainly. Um, at some point in the Meiji, it becomes the, it becomes the entryway into studying Shinran. Another blumism, but I think this is right. You read this, we're going to talk about this in a minute, if we have time. You read the Tanisho to study Shugi, you read the Kyogo Shinsho to study Shugaku. So Shugaku is a. Is a Get to that. All right. Uh, the purpose of studying Shinran is to reach an understanding of Shinran's religious perspective or mindset. The purpose of studying Shinran is not to maintain the tradition of Shinshu or to maintain some kind of fealty or debt to him as a founder of the sect. So these people are, in, sense, in some sense, in tension with their own church. Okay? The Kiyozawa and his followers were outside the church, critical of the church, as being too fuddy-duddy, too old-fashioned, and therefore sort of stuck in the mud. Okay? Uh, and so that's why we study Shinran, not to support the church, but to see who Shinran was. And once we see who Shinran was, that gives us an insight of who we are, or who we might be. That's what they're trying to do. People respect Renyo Deal. Renyo is a person who made Honganji the largest sect, the largest branch of Shinshu. Before Renyo, Honganji just saw, uh, you know, there. But Renyo kind of watered down Shinran's teachings from the Seiji perspective. He simplified things in a way. Maybe that's why he was successful. People could understand. But in any case, they don't like that. And they say, we have to kind of minimize Renyo. We have to jump over Renyo to study Shinran directly. Let's read Shinran's writings. Let's not read Renyo's explanation of what Shinran So that's an anti-establishment move. Another thing is the idea of nature. But a nature which is not part of traditional Shinshu doctrine is all over Shinran's writings, because Shinran quotes the Nirvana Sutra so much. Nature, this is the essence of Buddha in all living beings, it is something called original enlightenment, which is associated with not the Nirvana Sutra, but another text called the Awakening of Faith, uh, the Kishindon, and they don't like that text. So, these two things. Um, and people often express their understanding in terms of personal experience on the Higashi side. That is, people like some of this to talk about what Buddhism means to me, personally. In other words, I can't say what I mean to you, I can't say what the happens in my head, okay? That's the kind of thing you see in the Higashi side, and you have preachers that preach this way, and that's part of their appeal also, okay? Okay, Shugi and Shugaku. To be honest, I don't know how old this distinction is, but Kiyozawa talks about it. And he claims that this is a traditional distinction. So he probably learned it at some point from something from the Edo period. You know, Kiyozawa, sort of born in the late Edo period. Um, but the difference is this. Shugi represents what every Shin believer accepts on faith as a concern them as following this form of religion. That is
he is how he understands Shinran's liberty. What, sh what Shinshu is to him. Kiyozawa values this highly as well. But these ideas should be relatively uniform if understood historically, though not understood uniform. About the definition of what it means, what the Shinshu doctrine is that represents historical issue. That's not a personal, existential. When I say existential, I mean what it means to my existence, me. How my life is oriented as a result of this or not, okay? That, there's no need for uniformity. In fact, that kind of uniformity uh, is counterproductive, okay? So, Shugaku, on the other hand, is how we study all the evidence that allows us to know what Buddhism is or was at any particular time, and specifically how Shinshu got created as an institution and what the Shinshu tradition believes, right? So, Shugaku requires you though, um, if you think Shugi is difficult, Shugaku is also difficult, but in a different way. Shugaku requires you, for example, to deal with the fact that the larger sutra, where all the vowels are, right? Larger sutra is sort of the center of the whole definition of what pure land thought is about, pure land practice, pure land belief is about. Guess what? We have five translations of it in Chinese, and they're all different. <laughs> We have Tibetan translations, we have a number of Sanskrit manuscripts, and they're all different. So which larger sutra is the one to you, for you to believe in? You can't answer that. You have to accept all of them, right? You can say, well, maybe Honen and Shinran just use one, but guess what? They don't. They use a lot of them, okay? This is part of the way Buddhism worked in East Asia. So um, that's what Shugaku forces you to contend with. That's what Gaku means here. You've got to study all this stuff. Okay. Okay, now, apparent differences. This is another conclusion that I came to as a result of preparing for this talk today, is I see three major differences. There are probably other ones, but the three that I can identify immediately. Um, and one is the Tani Show. So, although they're both branches published so the Tani Show in the Edo period, only Higashi scholars wrote about it, misspelling. Beginning in 1662, I have gathered the names of 15 essays written by Higashi scholars published in the Edo period, and 21 produced in the Meiji period, including a story of a Tanisho text written in Braille. Chikazumi Jokan attains fame as a Tanisho preacher. This is all Higashi. There are no known essays by any Nishi scholars in the Edo period on the Tanisho can't find any. Now there may be one, I hope I find one. We have some essays by people who haven't been identified. So maybe one will turn up. But at this point there does not appear to be a tradition of studying the Tanisho in a serious way in the Edo period. Individuals may have studied on the Nishi side, but it was not apparently not a big part of the teaching curriculum, not a big part of the education. Okay? Nishi essay, the earliest Nishi essay is not published until 1909, okay? And there's only three in the Meiji period, okay? So it's really after the Meiji period that Nishi scholars begin to take up the Tanisho in a serious way. Today we don't see much distinction between the importance of the Tanisho for both sides, but this tradition is quite different. Okay. Another difference is the Nirvana Sutra. Again, um, Shinran, the second most sutra, this, the, of all the sutras that Shinran quotes, the, most, the one he quotes the most often is the largest sutra, and the one he quotes second most often is the Nirvana Sutra. Not other Pure Land Sutras, not the Contemplation Sutra. Why is the Nirvana Sutra so important for Shinran? This is a big enigma, okay? Uh, field, this is something that the Higashi scholars tried to put together, okay, in the Meiji period and probably in the Edo period as well. Um, we therefore have a tradition of strong Nirvana Sutra scholars coming from Higashi Honganji. Tokiwa Daijo, you know, these are all people, you know, Ocho, Eni, Chifuru, Taota, anyway, there's a long tradition, at least three, I can find at least three generations of Nirvana Sutra scholars at Otani Daigaku, I can't find any at Ryukoku. So this is another area where Higashi has gone very, put a lot of time into something that we don't see on the Nishi side. Um, Anjin Ketsu Josho. That's the reverse. That's a text that also services around the time of the Tiny Show, maybe a little later. It's a medieval thing. It's after um, Shinran. Nobody knows who the author is. Uh, the Nishi people liked it more than the Higashi people. So in the Edo period, we have these collections called Kana Shogo, that is um, sacred teachings in Kana, so that everybody could read them, even though the text may have been originally in Chinese, right? Kana just means Japanese. Um, and um, 
the Higashi people decided from the 1680s or so that the Anjin gets the Josho should not be in there. It's a Jodo shoot text, it's not a Shinshu text. So that's a difference. That's Kiho Ite. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, next. Um, so modern Japan, political imperative to standardize everything. If you want to know more about this, read the Imperial Rescript on Education. It's not very long. You can get it on the internet right away. It'll surprise you, I think, about the, the need for government requirement of loyalty to the king. Um, so again, this seems to, um, all right, we can go, there. yeah. So I'm going with, through my 10 points, okay? Um, Hypernationalism, how do we deal with that? It seems that for uh, two reasons, the Higashi side had a more difficult time adjusting to the hypernationalism of the Meiji period, and Showa as well. Probably, again, because of their legacy of supporting the Tokugawa Bakfu, uh, and again, because their scholarship uh, was somewhat more on the Nishi side. So we also the Higashi side sends scholars to Europe very early, okay? So Nanjo Bunyu goes to study with Max Mueller in the 1870s in Oxford, which is a sort of center of Buddhist studies for the whole world at that point. Uh, and with Max Mueller, he translates the Kangyo, the Contemplation Sutra, into English in the Sacred Books of the East. And he comes back. He becomes the second president of Otani University after Kiyozawa. And they implement um, Buddhist studies. Buddhist, what does Buddhist studies mean? Buddhist studies means, first of all, learning Sanskrit. So. Just an aside here, if you don't know this history, J Japan has received Buddhism from Korea and China, right? So everything is in the Chinese language, okay? The Chinese translated all the stuff from Sanskrit and other Indian languages, uh, but the Chinese threw away all those Indian texts because once it was in the national language, they didn't need any of this in Indian stuff anymore. So the Japanese got that, and they got the Chinese perspective on this. Now, in that perspective, Mahayana is better than Hinayana, right? And the Hinayana stuff is sort of for elementary school kids, and the Mahayana stuff is for high school and college kids. Well, when you get to the Meiji period and Buddhist studies come into Japan, for the first time the Japanese are presented with the possibility of reading the material in the Indian languages, not in Chinese, and they find something they never saw before. First of all, they find this earlier material label Hinayana is really wonderful, <laughs> okay? Uh, and just as inspiring as the Mahayana Sutras and a lot less mythic, okay? So, uh, in some way, it fits into a kind of modern scientific way of thinking and it's very attractive to them. So this has a big impact on Kiyozawa and the Seishin Shugi movement also. Next, oh, we're gonna... I'm not going to have enough time. Okay. Uh, okay. So how will Buddhist studies affect Shinshu culture? That's one of the questions. Um, and let me just say this. One of the things that happens uh, at this time, which is very radical, around 1900, a number of Japanese scholars begin to publish essays. And these people are associated with the University of Tokyo, which is the only really progressive school at that point in Japan, saying that Mahayana is the words of the Buddha. Because they now know enough about how Buddhism evolved in India to see that Mahayana is different than what was in the early level. Okay. Not just from reading uh, materials in Pali and Sanskrit, translated into Chinese. They've always been in Chi translated in Chinese, they've always been in the Chinese canon, but nobody read it. Okay. It was Hinayana. And when they look at it and they see it's quite different, okay, it appears to them, therefore, like it appears to many people today as well, that these Mahayana Sutras are the problem of the Buddhist community, not from Shakyamuni himself. Okay. That throws a real monkey wrench. That caused a lot of trouble. Okay. Next. All right, now we get to Kiyozawa. Um, he was as a fascinating guy, and partly it's because his mother was uh, sort of the Hiji Bomon. Think if you know what that is. His mother, Hiji Bomon, is these secret Shinshu societies throughout Japan. They're still around. They do all sorts of secret ceremonies that the church doesn't know about, and if they know about, they don't like. Okay, There's a lot of mysticism, a lot of weird things. They're very cool. Um, <laughs> his mother was a member of that. His father was from a Zen family. So his father's very stern, you know, jidiki all the way. His mother, taidiki all the way. I don't know what it was like growing up in that family, but anyway. <laughs> so keep 
has both lines coming into him from his parents, and they both strongly. So there's only a couple of pictures of him, but one of the pictures of Kiyosawa is he's standing in Zen robes with a begging bowl. So he's out begging, like Zen monks. And that beg are Zen monks, right? They do it for training purposes, not because they need the food and kills out. Uh, and he got in this thing called Minimum Possible, I don't know if that's up there, where he decided that he should eat less, you know? Started living on pine cone resin and just unbelievable things. He got, tubercul uh, got tuberculosis, yeah, and he died at the age of 42. It's really uh, kind of tragic, but, you know, obviously a big inspiration for the people around him. Okay, so, um, ethics. So this government push for Buddhists to teach ethics is seen by Kiyosawa as selling out, okay? And he writes very strongly that we should not do this, okay? The people immorality and ethics. But we're Buddhists. We teach Buddhism. Buddhism is not about attaining liberation through morality. Attaining liberation through in and reason. So he monks who are too easily accepting of that standard. Um, and then he has at the end of his life before he's dying, he writes a statement of his faith, which we have some here. Okay. Uh, not yet. Um, okay, so running out of time, so let's just jump to uh, jump to the next one. See if we have the. Okay, so this is from his S famous essay, Wagashin. What is it that I believe in, and why do I do this? What sort of effects are produced by such a thing? There are various points to consider here. Let me look at the effects first. This believing that I do has a primary effect of removing distress and pain from my life, particularly for someone high positive like myself. And especially now when my emotional state is aggravated by illness because he's going to die in about six months. Okay? Uh, if this thing I am calling faith were not there, it would be impossible to avoid extremes of distress and anxiety. Again, we don't see this kind of writing in the earlier period. This is a very modern way of expression. Really confessing what it really means to you and how your life can function because of your faith. It's very powerful. Uh, it is only through personal and truly know the presence or absence of the benefits of faith. Okay. But my belief in the Tathagata is not just a result of seeing the effects of this faith, it has another important basis. My belief in the Tathagata occurs at the limit of everything that I know. So what does this tell us? This tells us that Kiyosawa is can't, can't help himself from being curious and an intellectual who's trying to study everything, right? And he studies and he studies and he studies and he finally reaches the end of the study and that's when his faith begins. Only through exhausting himself, doing everything he can to figure out things in terms of rational intellectual history, that's when faith can begin. So what is this? This is GDK pursued to its end point. And when you get to the point that GDK doesn't work anymore, boom, then you can see GDK. So this is what Kiyosawa is telling you. This is how he arrived at this, okay? And what does this tell us? He's talking about Shinran, right? It's the same thing, right? Honen and Shinran went through the same thing. They follow the Jidiki path and they get to the end and they hit a ball and they say, it doesn't work anymore. But his point is not just telling us how he feels, but telling us that this is how you have to understand time. You have to exhaust your Jidiki first. If you don't, it's just intellectually convenient for you to say, it doesn't mean the same thing. This is what I call the existential perspective. That's what's really powerful about his voice. Okay. A little more. Um, within my faith, there's an elephant that believes in the ineffectiveness of my own efforts. And to believe in my own ineffectiveness, it was necessary first to exhaust my entire range of intellectual faculties to the point where I could no longer even raise my head. This effort involved an incredible ordeal. Before I, find, before I finally reached this limit that I speak of time and again, I concluded that religious truth must be such and such. Only to have that conviction destroyed by subsequent experience. As long as one attempts to establish their religious grounding by means of logic or research, such upheavals are inevitable. What is good? What is bad? What is truth? What is false? What is happiness and what is unhappiness? One cannot possibly understand any of these things. When I stood on that ground of understanding nothing, I threw up my hands and came to trust in the Tathagata. And this became the focal point of my faith. Okay. okay. We better go to Soga. All right, we just jump down. Next. Uh, keep going. All right. Sorry. Out of time. Um, so, all right. So, 
Reverend Meza spoke about Soga. As I mentioned to you, Soga's been inspiring to me as well. Soga's incomprehensible and just wonderful. You know? <laughs> and you know, if you like inquiry, you'll love Soga. Just like the ritual music when you were chanting earlier, I love that, you know. I don't understand it, but I love it. Soga's sort of like that. <laughs> really innovative thinker, okay? Um, so these are some of the people that are in Kilzawa's movement. We don't have time to talk about all of them, but um, Soga is kind of a mystic. Okay, next. And really had a big impact, at least on the Higashi side, was Soga talked about the fact that we should be thinking about Hozo Bosatsu made that vow. Okay? Hozo Bosatsu, Dharmakata made that before he became Amida. Also, not Amida, okay? We are in the same town as Hozo Bosatsu. That's why he speaks to us. We should be thinking about kind of a personal existential. We're actually on the same playing field. Never see him. Image, that's about. It's just a regular guy. So, uh, good, okay. All right, we just get, just, you better jump down. Okay, this is uh, this is Soga. Even supposing that the unhindered light, okay, obviously this is you know, the light of the Amida, right? Uh, illuminates the sea of suffering of actual existence. What benefit would that bring to the self that is drowning at the bottom of the sea? So you're in the bottom of the ocean, the light's way up there on the surface of the water. What does that do you, right? <laughs> Indeed, what is truly demanded by the actual present reality is not the sky, but the arc of the vow sea of real human life. It is not the eternal Dharmakaya Buddha who is the savior of the real self. The savior of the real world must be a human Buddha who deigns to appear in the real world. That Christianity speaks of a trinity. Pauses Jesus human beings to consider this God-man Jesus as the true and direct savior is undoubtedly for the sake of satisfying this same demand. The Father, the supreme God, being eternal light is not a being in intimate contact with the real world. Between the fog, eternal light, and us human beings who are floundering at the bottom of the ocean of samsara, there is a distance as great as that between heaven and earth. The majesty. So this phrase, wako dojin, is from Taoism, actually. Okay, it's about sort of adapting the light to fit the dust-filled situation. Okay, that's why Dimi has deigned to appear as Dharmakara Bodhisattva Hozo, right? Dharmakara, who is our savior. That's who we should think about, right? Okay, next. Especially in connection with the very subjective act of faith, it is not fitting to speak of the acting in my place. Instead, we better speak of the Tathagata directly becoming me. Besides, the truth itself of entrusting faith is the core of the 18th vow. And what is called other power of salvation in the original vow is ultimately nothing but the Tathagata deigning to become the subject of the surrendering faith of the Nembutsu practitioner. As long as one places Dharmakara Bodhisattva or his original vow simply on the objective level, in the rank of object of faith, one cannot yet call The experience is the children's heart of entrusting. Truly the 18th vow would tell heart of the vow. And show oh, that's Kiho Itai from the Anshin Kitsu Josho who Soga is not supposed to accept because it's a Dharmakara Bodhisattva is the figure of the unity of the Dharma and of sentient beings. Of the Buddha mind and the mind of the common mortal. Okay. Uh, okay. So I think uh, we have a time problem. I have a time problem. <laughs> Sorry for including you in my subjectivity. That's the third person that I... Um, yeah, here, okay. So he's the third interesting Higashi figure. Um, 
knew Sogov, all knew each other. Um, also an outsider. So Kanako have up here of the pure land, Jodo no Kanden. She said with, um, with the same kind of critique, Jodo Kyono Hihan, that the, the church is not ready to accept historical and analytical view to modern right, in the study. But Shikazumi decides, I'm not going to be a university professor, I'm going to be a preacher. Okay. So, uh, he grew up in a small temple in Shiga. He studied in the philosophy department at the University of Tokyo, just like Kiyozawa. So he has this Hegel and Kant Western philosophical <coughs> education. You know, and Inoue Enryo, another Higashi Honganji person, who uh, founds um, Tokai Daigaku, and he was sent to America by Honganji to learn how Christianity is facing its modern difficulties. He's here for about a year. He comes back, and they becomes famous as a Tanisho preacher. Okay. Uh, fairly interesting. Called the Roku, the record of my uh, repentance. Okay, my uh, my. He's speaking Kansai Ben in his writings. It's very interesting. Um, do not believe what you want to believe. Believe what you find. Believe what you find. You have no choice but to believe. Okay. Very Kiyozawa like statement. Okay. Next one. So here's from his Zangeidoku, his record of his confessions. The standard of confession or repentance upon which we know how to live is precisely what is explained in the Nirvana Sutra. When Ajase, Ajatasati, reached the point where he brought forth a faith within himself that had no karmic roots, which is also known as the rootless faith, right? So if you don't know the story, Ajase is a prince who kills his father. His father is the number one supporter of Shakyamuni. Therefore, it's a big scandal, okay? He does this in order to become king quickly so he can expand the territory. He thinks his father is being too naive. His enemies are about to attack. I'm going to be the tough guy. His kingdom expands. He's successful. And then guess what? Nihilism sets in. Then he goes, holy shit. Oh, can't say that. Um, I don't feel all over his body. And he goes to all these doctors, and doctors can't heal him. And finally he goes, and this is all in the Nirvana Sutra, okay? And he goes to the Buddha, and the doctor says, the only person who can heal you is Shakyamuni Buddha. He goes to see the Buddha, and the Buddha says, you know why you're sick. <laughs> and they have this very intense personal dialogue, where finally I, the Buddha says, you have to confess your crimes, not just to me, but to yourself. Okay? Admit what you did. If you don't do that, there's no chance for any transformation within you. So this puts confession or repentance at the heart of the religious experience. Nirvana Sutra, which is not something that's typical for Buddhism. Uh, anyway, um, so, so they call this religious faith because his karma develops faith anyway. These are the words that Shinran Shonin took as his faith, and he called it Shinshu. The core of this is found most explicitly at the end of the chapter on faith, found among the six roles that make up of the Kyoga Shinshu, where the Nirvana Sutra passage is quoted extensively. This is where the Shoni first speaks his mind about himself, truly drowning in a sea of desire, lost in the mountains, seeking fame, etc. Shinran's statement is brief but filled with deep significance when combined with the words of the Nirvana Sutra. I have proudly thought that, whatever the nuance of the language here, I cannot help but feel that Shinran is using the confessions of Ajase instead has his own personal confession, right? In general, people speak of confession or repentance in the West as a means to express the process by which they came to faith, and that in Buddhism we didn't have that sort of thing. But what Shinran is doing, even if he doesn't speak of it in those terms, is like an opening up of what's really in his heart. Okay. Well, we're out of time. So, um, so just in conclusion, um, these are three of the interesting people on the Higashi side from this period. This sets up tradition, all of it, in some sense, not only in opposition to what had been before in terms of how Shinshu was church. That is, these are Higashi people who are on the outside of Higashi at the same time. They have a tenuous relationship. They're kicked out of the church. They're brought back in again. Okay, And they insist that this is what Shinshu means, is to be a critical person standing on the edge, right? Uh, and to think freely and to, and to approach this in a personal, subjective way, a way of inquiry until you find your personal voice here. And that's what really, I think, the Kiyozawa legacy is all about. Okay, thanks very much. We don't have any...